It's E-Commerce Minute, your weekly dose of e-commerce tech and retail news with your host, John Suter, Bart Moraz, and Brittany Blackman. The E-Commerce Minute is a production of Sumo Heavy, a digital commerce consulting firm in Brooklyn, New York, and Philadelphia. Find us on the web at sumoheavy.com. It's the E-Commerce Minute, episode 775. These are top stories in e-commerce tech and retail for the week of December 7th, 2020. UPS, no bueno. As the holiday season ramps up, UPS has told drivers across the country to stop picking up packages from six major retailers, including Gap, Nike, and Macy's. The restrictions come as the company attempts to keep up with a record-breaking online shopping season amid the ongoing pandemic. The company said that when retailers' demand exceeds the allowance, items will be shipped when additional space becomes available. Many drivers say they haven't seen limits like this during previous holiday seasons. It's a sign that UPS is metering the flow of packages into its network to preserve its performance during one of the busiest shopping weeks of the year. The National Retail Federation estimated that online shopping jumped 44% over a recent five-day stretch that included Black Friday and Cyber Monday. FedEx and UPS both prepared their customers for tight capacity for this holiday season as consumers, fearful of venturing out to stores due to the virus, are stocking up on household essentials from online merchants at the same time the holiday shopping season kicks off. The precautions are expected to create a surplus of as many as 7 million daily packages between Thanksgiving and Christmas, according to ShipMatrix Incorporated, a software provider that analyzes shipping data. FedEx's big customers include Walmart, while UPS counts Amazon among its biggest shippers. The company is still working closely with its largest shippers to steer volume to locations with available capacity and making sure that large customers know how much room is available. We predicted this. <laughs> mm-hmm. We predicted well, this. I, I mean, every year this happens, right? Like every year it, it's like it gets bigger and bigger. And as much as they like, they go, okay, we have 10 more, 10 times more capacity for the holiday season. And they just, and it breaks. The, there every- is, yeah. I mean, you can only scale up so much. And I always try to use like Philly or New York City as an example. It's like, how many trucks can you fit on the street? How much can fit in each truck? How many trucks can you put out at once? It, you know, it's you reach a point where it's like, okay, this is just broken. You know, you, you're just gonna have to wait your turn. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just, and especially now, right, where everything is delivered now. You know, it, all of a sudden, your capacity that you're like, oh, we're gonna plan for 10, 10 times next year. All of a sudden, you're like, oh crap, it's a thousand times more. Yeah, and it's not just people saying, oh, well, you know, get me a cable charger and things like that. Now you're getting just basic stuff delivered, and each and a package is a package. It does not matter what is inside the package. If it's an avocado or a cable charger or a, a Vitamix, it's still a package on a truck, and it still has to be processed. And yeah, I mean, got- but you also you also look at how many people they hired, or they can hire more people. People got sick. You know, what I mean, there's a lot of yeah. those kind of things. Like you're you're playing the whole game of is there enough people? Forget just trying to get through the system. But yeah, no, that's it, that's a good point. Yeah. Cope with the. I got a stat here to cope with the demand. FedEx and UPS have hired seventy thousand and one hundred thousand seasonal employees. Amazon is building one hundred new fulfillment warehouses across the U.S. and obviously those get staffed. I tried to find a stat before we got on the pod here, but yeah, they're hiring something like a hundred thousand people or something like that. It's something insane yeah. through Amazon. Amazon is just hiring absolutely insane. They're going crazy. Right and that's, that's not going to stop. I mean, that's going to continue. Mm-hmm. I said a couple of podcasts ago, there's three Amazon warehouses that popped up within a five mile radius of my house within the last six months, which is great, but the traffic is really going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> It's good. I mean, listen, if people should shop, shop as small as possible to help out small businesses. I you know, that. But Amazon's going to be there for convenience and it's always going to deliver stuff. And, you know, you, you're playing the game of do I do I ship it myself? Do I put it into Amazon sort of system? And there's all issues itself there. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to consider. But I would say if you can shop small as much as you can, the better. Yeah, and you get the argument is like, oh, well, there's small businesses on Amazon. I'm like, yeah, not quite. Sure. The same. you know, I you mean, still- they are, but like, not all, not all small businesses is going to be on there because it, it it takes a lot of sort of managing and. I doing I would like to put an addendum to your credo there: shop small and local. Local and definitely, local. definitely, definitely shop local, small as much as you can to support these businesses. You know, takeout is always good if you can. Yeah. And what you have to remember is, you know, when you, it's easy to say shops, shop small, but shop small and local because you still live in this neighborhood and 
you don't want to see the small shops close up and wind up having CVS on four corners. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you know in bigger in bigger sort of cities, it's it's less noticeable, I guess. I mean, you still see it, but little tiny towns are are definitely it's been it's been definitely hurt again. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Walburn effect. We, you know, but that's a whole other topic. We'll just close this one out. FedEx recently announced that it acquired ShopRunner, which provides free two-day shipping and free returns from its partner stores for an annual fee of seventy-nine dollars. Which brings us to our next story: Walmart Plus removes minimum order cost. The competition between Walmart and Amazon continues to heat up. Walmart is removing its $35 online minimum cost for Walmart Plus members to better compete with Amazon Prime. Members of the program will now be eligible to receive free next day and two-day shipping with only one item in their cart. But Walmart will still require non-Walmart Plus customers to spend the $35 or more to get the free shipping. However, this doesn't apply to the same day orders of groceries or other items fulfilled by Walmart stores, but rather online shopping where orders are placed through Walmart's traditional e-commerce channels. So basically that means there's no longer a minimum order requirement on the next day and two day shipping that's offered on items shipped from walmart.com, no matter the basket total. The change coming only a couple months after Walmart Plus's launch positions the new program as a more true alternative to Amazon Prime, as Prime's biggest perk has always been its free fast shipping service that encourages consumers to shop online without worrying about minimum order sizes. The Walmart Plus program grew out of Walmart's Delivery Unlimited, an early version of the service that had also involved Walmart store staff picking orders which are handed off to delivery partners. In the past, those partners have included Postmates, DoorDash, Roadie, and Point Pickup, among others. But most recently, Walmart acquired last mile delivery operation Joyrun to bring more of its delivery logistics business in-house. Unlike some grocery delivery services, Walmart differentiates itself because it could also fulfill orders of other everyday items from its store shelves, not just food and household goods. And while Amazon Prime has expanded over the years to include all sorts of benefits like free music, streaming video, ebooks, audiobooks, gaming perks, and more, Walmart Plus so far remains focused on its core features like shipping benefits and cost savings and clocking in at 98 bucks a year or $12.95 a month so the cheaper Walmart price can appeal to consumers interested only in free delivery. And that is a very good point because I think as they add more things to Prime, I know myself, I got I shrug my shoulders and go, hmm. I mean, I'll still pay for it, but they, they <laughs> add things on that I'll never use. And I'm sure that's what a lot of people, it's, you know. Yeah, like, as much as I was like, shop. yeah, I still use Amazon stuff all the time. I mean, that's just, you're so conditioned for so long. It's like. And I, I hate that even, feeling. <laughs> you know, but like, I didn't even notice that it increases price, right? We use so much of it for other things that. All right, it's just there, right? And so Amazon Prime launched when? It, it's been it's been long, long time, which was a very smart move for them <clears throat> back then. Like Walmart trying to get into this now is, is is also smart, I think, on their part, just because it's a different shopper, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so whenever Amazon Prime launched, oh, 15 years ago. Oh, it was launched in February of 2005, so 15 years ago. Wow, it seems like 20 years ago to me. But I remember it used to be 79 bucks. And back then it was like, oh, I, I, that was like a big, like, I was like, does this really worth yeah, it? Yeah, but for two day shipping, like that was just it, right? And then you start to get hooked on the ship and you're like, ah, uh, yeah, I don't pay this every year. And it, and it you're right, it creeps up and creeps up, but yeah. It's, and then it's like before work. the pandemic, I mean, they, they went to like the next day and then there's sometimes I ordered like eight o'clock at night and I, because of where they're placing their warehouses, all of a sudden I had it in the morning by 5 a.m. Like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Just happened. You're like, what? what okay. <laughs> and, you know, they lose money on it sometimes and they, you know, make money overall. Like, that's just the way it is. Walmart doing this is a good thing. They needed it. They needed to do it and they needed to do it a long time ago. But I just, it just forced us their hand. I don't know if you, I don't know if you subscribe to it or not. I have not. I don't, you know, I don't really go to Walmart. Sometimes I do if I have to. But, it seems like a good option for a lot of people. Oh, you mean you just the, they, just from the shipping part of it? So do you know if they actually include groceries in the, in that in that whole membership? All right. So I'm looking at the Walmart Plus page. The things that are actually eligible for the free shipping, no order minimum, is the stuff that comes from the warehouse. So I think because the groceries come local, that is a different service. I'm looking, 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 and I do not see anything about groceries. That is a point of difference right there. 
But what's neat is you can get a free trial. Let's see, what's the free trial? 15 day free trial. Uh, and again, it's st stuff that ships from the warehouse. So it's weird. I started using Walmart just for price comparison against Target because obviously we're trying not to hit stores, you know, as often as we can avoid it. And Walmart and Target have been convenient for us. And I tried, you know, being in the business, I try to compare the two. And what I noticed with Walmart is sometimes their delivery is a lot quicker and they don't even deliver in boxes. They threw two plastic bags on my step the other day with contact mm -hmm. solution and something else. It was two plastic bags ripped up with a big barcode tag on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it, it must, must be delivered from this. It was store. probably local, right? But it does. Uh, it's not specified. I don't, I don't care. I don't care. I mean, that's fine. yeah. So it looks like uh, free delivery from your store. So if they deliver groceries and and from your stores, there's a thirty five dollar minimum. Okay, but it's easy to spend. It's really easy to spend thirty five dollars on groceries this year, this year. So yeah, but it's neat. They have this little calculator here. You can save two two and a half hours. Per week. Oh, okay. Getting weekly groceries from your store. Save $84 a year uh, saving on gas prices and fuel. Uh, okay. Yeah. So they're trying to sell you on that. Yeah. So Walmart plus pretty good, even better now that they're waiving the delivery fee. That's great. And again, as Bart had pointed out, this is for a different kind of shopper. They haven't shared the numbers on its growth or how many customers have signed up, but BMO Capital Market estimated in November that about 19 million households had signed up based on surveying Walmart customers. In comparison, Amazon had about 126 million U.S. Prime members as of October, but they had a 15-year head start. So there. And, <laughs> Just a little bit. Right. And at Walmart, you know, they have 4,700 stores in the U.S., which boosted supply chain efficiency because 90% of Americans live within 10 miles of a Walmart store. That's that famous Walmart stat. Walmart, like many large retailers, has benefited by the acceleration of e-commerce driven by the pandemic. The company in its third quarter earnings reported e-commerce sales were up 79% in the quarter with earnings of $1.34 share on revenue that was up 5.2% year over year to $134.7 billion with a B. Big numbers from Walmart. Big Check it out. With a B. <laughs> All right, next story. Facebook is buying customer. Facebook has made one of its biggest moves yet to build out the business services it provides on its platform. It is acquiring customer, and that's spelled with a K, a startup founded with the aim of disrupting the customer service industry with a new approach to providing agents with better data and a more unified picture of users. If you've never heard of this company, that makes two of us, but this is one of those, you know, back-end back -end companies that provides a service that obviously Facebook found very valuable. The deal costs Zuck's baby a staggering $1 billion with a B. The acquisition will be Facebook's largest in terms of deal size since its Oculus acquisition in March 2014 and its third largest acquisition overall. Customer enables companies to gather customer data from different channels and view them on a single screen. I was just checking a little demo of this. It's actually pretty cool. So this is a lot of like backend stuff that most consumers will not know or care about. But it's important to note that Facebook Messenger and Instagram are also already integrated with customer. Back in October, which feels like eight years ago, Facebook said that the number of people messaging businesses through Instagram and message, Messenger has increased by 40% over the last year. The startup's AI features may also have been a factor behind the acquisition. There are roughly 175 million people using Facebook for business today, covering both those who use Facebook to engage with the business that use Facebook as their primary identity in place of a website or a mobile app, and those businesses that provide conversation channels on Facebook-owned messaging apps like Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp as a complement to other ways to contact them. Considering that Facebook has upwards of 2 billion users, 175 million it doesn't sound like a lot, but as the company starts to see spicier competition from the likes of Snapchat, TikTok, and likely others over time, having a better product to sell businesses alongside their other services will give Facebook a better way of locking them into the Facebook ecosystem, and not to mention new streams of revenue. Customer has raised at least $173 million from investors, including Cisco Investments and Tiger Global Management. One billion yep. Million. For a company that's, that fine. that's great. <laughs> you never heard of a customer? <laughs> Customer's been around for a while. It's in the line of the CRM, AI, chatbot, you know, customer right. service type. Right. There's a lot of them. I think 
It used to be desk.com, I think was one of the best where they just pull in, you know, all the info from everywhere. This is good. I mean, I think, you know, besides Facebook being a political place, people do use it as a, as a primary business site, which is kind of cool if you do it right. Having a customer service in one site and you have to build one, it, it's great. Like you, you could literally run your whole website, especially if you're like a restaurant or something like that, right off of Facebook, right? With a mobile app, you don't have to really build anything. It's right there. You just got to update it all the time. I will um, echo that and use uh, sort of a personal experience. I help manage a few Facebook pages for nonprofits and some organizations. And the one in particular uh, is running, they're trying to get a catering thing going. And we basically just took a rough look at the traffic coming into their website for the ordering. 85% of all of their customers come from Facebook. Now, I believe mm-hmm. that is a demographic thing. Their, their, their audience skews a bit older, but 85%. I mean, that is just, and the rest of the percent is Google searches and from their email list. Mm-hmm. So it's, like, I mean, when you do a search for a restaurant, usually a Facebook page will pop up faster and correct. nobody really updates their site that much. Like everybody just goes, oh, just up here's, here's all the updates, especially in, in the pandemic, where it's like everybody's updating their Facebook, like, oh, we're open today, or here's our takeout menu. Like it was the only place that people did it. Yeah. And I'm noticing just through, and again, this is just personal experience, the pages that I manage, there's another nonprofit that I help out with just, you know, from the kindness of my heart that they use messenger like crazy. Like we were doing a fun drive for something and these people, they just, they click on that button. They have no hesitation to do that. Where I was, whereas two years ago, I would say it would be the adoption would be almost zero. So I think people are a lot more, not afraid to use the conversational part of it. And what remains to be seen is how the AI chatbots can keep up with this. I know, cause a lot of that stuff comes up as canned responses and people kind of roll their eyes, but for that type of audience to, to be able to go into Facebook, click a button and get an answer right away, I think is invaluable and is worth a lot more than just having a static website that just may sometimes, you know, especially with restaurants may leave more questions than answers because <laughs> yeah, kind I of think neglect that stuff. Right. It's the perceived value of getting an answer from a person, right? You, you, you have a canned response, but it's still more than trying to look for an FAQ or answer or emailing them, right? Or if picking a up a phone answered, and getting a voicemail that you know is never going to be returned. Right. This is faster, you know, and, and it's just as much as we understand that there are a lot of canned responses, it still works. It's still fast enough, right? It's like, oh, I just need this. I don't want to look through your pages of pages of site that really won't give you an answer. Yeah, and people don't. <laughs> yeah, and, and obviously people don't have the patience anymore. So right. it's sad that everything has to get point to Facebook, but as much as we complain about it, there is a lot of utility there and it's very valuable to businesses. If only we could just sift out the rest of it and just lock it off and put, build a giant sarcophagus around it and never see it again, but that's never going to happen. I think it will. <laughs> Like you make, you know, as much as it, it, people complain about it, it's like you, you you make your own, right? You sign up or join groups by yourself. So you you make your own venture, right? <laughs> if you go deep down dark holes of, of, of Facebook, then, well, it sucks. But if you are- You dug the hole yourself. That's, that's, that's yeah. a great analogy, Bart. That's good. You make like, your own, you make your own adventure. That's right. Because your experience is, my experience is going to be different than yours and, and definitely different than the guy next door. Yeah, I think that what's valuable too is like we, we talk about shop small, shop local. I mean, Facebook is great for that. You have neighborhood sort of groups that are out there and you can follow and see what's going on in neighborhoods, especially in small towns. And it's great actually because it gives you a lot more info for the town than than anything else. That's absolutely right. And Google is trying to do that. I mean, Google business is actually pretty good, but I think people still look at that as like, I have a question and I get an answer and I'm and I expect to see, 50 ads wrapped around my question to get, and you, you feel like you still feel, even though Google's gotten a lot better with that kind of stuff, especially Google local and Google business, you still feel like you're on an adventure. It's like, Oh, am I getting yeah. the answer or am I getting someone else's answer? Is that the real right, answer? But you also like, right. In Facebook, you have not only the, the, the business answer, right. But you also have people commenting that live in the neighborhoods are like, Oh no, you should do this. Or this is bad. Like you still have a better version of that. Yeah. So that's, it's more of an authentic experience as opposed to random stranger from, you know, a city that you don't even live in <laughs> trying to provide an answer to you. Right. 
Good point. All right. So for Facebook, its customer relationship profile up to now has been about users within its app wall. This acquisition gives it a much bigger opportunity to essentially control that bigger picture and bigger relationship, regardless of the platform being used, because they're trying to go omni-channel, cross-platform. They want to try to, you know, and I don't know if you've uh, noticed on Facebook or Instagram, they're trying to unify the messenger thing, which kind of scares me, Mm -hmm. your Instagram and your messenger, messenger app and your WhatsApp and all that. That's a little scary because I, I, you know, I think some people, including myself, I like to silo myself off from certain platforms. You and I can do a whole thing about Instagram having all that stuff in there now. Yeah, (laughs) it's just, I don't know. Yeah, so unifying all the messaging makes sense from a business standpoint, but I don't know. I'm I'm still I'm still a little wary about that because again, I, I I prefer to I don't know, I prefer to silo some some users off and not hear from them, but that's just my peccadillo. All right, you got anything to add to that one? Mm, nope. Customer with a K, with a one billion with a B. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. We'll be back next Friday to break down the week's e-commerce, tech, and retail news. And don't forget our other podcast, our long-form podcast called In the Ring. That's available on Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. Until then, we'll see you on the internet next Friday. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.